Well, uh, first I'd like to acknowledge the contributions that you've made in your talk. Thank you for inviting. This has been an interesting, I would say the most interesting of geodesign summits. And we've covered very practically uh, technology things from graphics and details to concept, from methods to tools. Uh, we've looked at little areas and we've looked at big areas. We've dealt with policies and we've also dealt with methods. Interesting, right? So as you're voting, one of the things that you should be thinking about is what is the most impactful thing that you saw? I mean, actually, the speakers, all of them, uh, deserved a bigger audience, don't you think? That's one of my conclusions. Every talk was stellar. Okay, Carl has a few criticisms for a few. Okay, fine. <laughs> for example, mine. <laughs> it's, it's quite okay. <laughs> Uh, but I, I just say, generally speaking, the people who attended this, that is you, uh, were enriched, weren't you? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so amazing because you are enriching each other through open sharing of what you are doing. And this is, this is an unusual kind of forum. It doesn't happen exactly like this very often. It's not a professional forum, it's not an academic forum, it's not a professional association forum, it's just people getting together, sharing what they do, and that's part of its big value. This is the first time you were here, why, why are you being so quiet? <laughs> you should, do you have anything to say? Um, it's the second time I've been over in California, I came to the UC for the first time last year, Yes. and it's been really interesting in uh, I've really enjoyed seeing the take on landscape architecture that's here. It's a, a little different to what I've been used to with our landscape architects back home. Um, and seeing how we deal with land parcel, land parcel management over here at the state government. And in the discussion yesterday, I asked the question about, I've seen a lot of really great environmental um, initiatives and work, and uh, but it all seems to be from the kind of grassroots up. and less from the uh, federal government down, and you know, that, that does seem to be the case. That's uh, yes. quite a different take to in the UK. Yeah, when people look at China, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes they're frightened by the massive force that China represents. But when you look at it more closely, it's fragile. And, and, um, mm -hmm. and as we're seeing today with the uh, coronavirus, it's difficult to manage. Mm -hmm. such a large organization and such a large society. It's a quite, quite extraordinary place. The United States is almost exactly the different, different uh, flip-flop. Mm -hmm. When you look at the United States from a distance, <laughs> it looks pretty horrible. I mean, the politicians are polarized and going back. But as you get closer to the ground into small communities, uh, it looks better and better oh, yeah. because there's lots of participation mm -hmm. and uh, in community involvement. And some of the examples that were shown here uh, that, that embraced geodesign as a kind of democratic way to have people uh, build their communities is, is reflecting actually what's happening in small rural America or uh, you know, not the capital of the United States or even the capital cities. Uh, it's, it's really exciting to me, this uh, way to characterize America. Mm -hmm. And I think geodesign plays right into that democratic way to create the future. And as we're challenged by these huge challenges of, uh, of overpopulation and technology growth that's driving it and the human footprint, uh, I, I think the only way out is that you have lots of people involved. Everybody's involved. <laughs> And so the examples for me, watching you help communities help themselves to create a better future is the way it's got to be in the future. Um, but I know, I'm, I'm very interested to know your perspective. And by the way, thank you for helping us build the railroad line. Next year, those of you who come back will take the railroad from L.A. out to uh, Redlands. It will be yeah. delightful. And thanks to Matt McDonald for doing the engineering work to support it. Great.
I'll be meeting the guys working on that project tomorrow, so ah, okay. I'll give the feedback. They're behind, so let's get a little bit of uh, value we got going here. Yeah. Well, why don't we open it up for questions of, um, from the audience and comments. Uh, just before we do that, can I ask, how many of you will come back to this if we hold it next year? Okay, 87. <laughs> okay. Um, you have any questions? Comments? Thoughts? Yes? Um, so, since I've been here, I've been doing a lot of walking around. It's been my primary uh, form of transport. Since I've been here, I've been doing a lot of walking around. It's been my primary form of transportation. Yes. And I've noticed a lot of signs for measure G, yes. um, both for and against. Um, obviously, Esri's a big player you know, in Redlands, and I was just wondering, <clears throat> pardon me, um, how you walk that line with your company when there are, you know, potentially big ticket items like that in your own backyard? I don't live in Redlands, I live in Mintown. <laughs> I don't get to vote, <laughs> I don't. It sounds like a crazy thing, but I, I think uh, it's democracy at work. There's arguments for measure G, which is uh, around train stations, being able to have higher density transit uh, villages, and there's measures, there's uh, opinions, strong opinions against it because there's the old people that want to hold on to the past of Redlands. And Redlands is a very rich historical community, and the values that are, that are here expressed in, in social fabric here and in architecture and in density, you know, there's that side of it. There's that side of it as well. Are you asking me for my opinion, or uh, uh, not necessarily? Not necessarily your opinion. Um, you know, it could be a loaded question. I'm not a reporter. I'm not here you know, to, to ask those kinds of <laughs> yeah. questions. I just want to know. You know, right. um, from a, you know, we see we talk about all these geo design initiatives um, from a global perspective, but when it comes home to roost, you know, geo design could play a role right here in this community with that measure, and so I was just looking for your perspective on it. Is, uh, is Christine here? Christine Ma? She presented, uh, I guess, in the first day. She's built a complete urban uh, model, 3D model, that's modeled out alternatives of higher density or keeping the same, and that's starting to filter out into the community. But ESRI itself is not taking an active lead and trying to push it one way or the other. I just don't think it's right for us to do that. Um, so we're, we are spending the money to build the models. We are spending the money to build the models and let people see them. Uh, but uh, I think, um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. There was a question up here, yes? More of an observation. Um, so I was here a couple of years ago, 2017, and I was presenting some work that some ESRI staff and, and, and we did in San Francisco Planning Department on 3D symbolization. Yeah, it was amazing. It was the first time I'd, I'd been here, I shared the stage with you and really appreciated that opportunity. And when I, and I hadn't been, I'd had a chance to come back since, yeah. and when I looked at the agenda for this session, I was very uh, astounded at the just the sense of the difference between the development state of geodesign three years ago and where it is now, in the sense that the applications now are much more systems oriented, they're 3D, they're very robust, they really are getting to decision analysis, and it's very impressive. Um, in addition, and, and from the work that we did a few years ago, we did an EEAP about a year and a half ago with your staff trying to, um, automate a growth policy analysis workflow that we've got up there and, and really shift our um, information and analysis work, data analytics work to a modern kind of method. And one of the things I noted um, in many of the talks here this couple days was uh, a point that Helen made and, and really sort of the rationale I think for her new role, which is like how do you get the maximum value out of all these tools and how do you put them together in a way that um, modernizes whole workflows across you know, different groups, organizations, et cetera. 
And I'd just like to make the observation and, and leave you with the, the point that that's kind of the challenge that I face in San Francisco and my little group across our little department, et cetera, and, and the whole city. And so I'm really reaching out to uh, and hope to define a next EEAP that's a full solution um, process as opposed to, oh, here's a nice tool, here's a little workshop, you know, learn the tool, kind of figure out how to use it, whatever. I, I think the, the, the point we're at right now really requires a much um, a f more complete and robust implementation. Yes. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I think that our practices and, um, you know, it, it, I mean, even talking to my, my, uh, my bosses about this, it's hard to engage them in understanding the new power and potential because it's not just a, a version update. You know, it's a new way of doing business, right? And we need to catch up our marketing and our sales and our training and, and full concepts around that. So it's my observation for you. Want to say something, Helen? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, yeah, the new way of working, um, I, yeah, I, I'm in a maybe slightly luckier position that our uh, leadership has recognized that um, earlier on, kind of ahead, and, and, and want to push that and support that. Um, so that helps. But yeah, it, it's that you, you get the tools out there, and then at first you get lots of little um, groups of people doing things, which is great with ideas, but then you've got to be careful of um, finding that s siloed and people are, are duplicating effort in different places, so bringing it through a, a bit more centrally and having um, processes that can be shared and reused rather than having things, um, you know, all this rework going on is, is definitely a big part of it to make sure you get that value. And that's one of the, the big things we're getting into now is looking at um, the business value of what we're doing and what we're getting out of this agreement as well as our other agreements so that we can prove that going forwards. Um, so that's in our EAP, that's our, our next big challenge is to sit down and discuss how can we do that. Um, we don't have a complete answer yet on, on that. Um, but then again, I think back to the systems-based approach and in terms of um, environmental systems and looking at everything and then the driver for bringing this all together and through web systems is just how complex of an issue development is becoming these days with all the different factors we have to bring in and you know that can only really be done by these big systems big computing um, and you know GIS is a perfect single um, analytical environment there to, to look at everything and it's even more so, I think, with today, this morning, when I, I woke up and had a look at my news feed, as Google knows what I'm interested in, as always. Um, and in the first couple of notices, there was the um, news that the uh, Court of Appeal in the UK has just um, upheld uh, a challenge by an environmental group and the London Mayor um, that the Heathrow expansion project is counter to the government's climate change policy and counter to the Paris Agreement that was signed to be carbon neutral. So that means suddenly <laughs> it, everything's uh, up for question now. Um, apparently the government aren't going to appeal that decision, even though that they said only just a few months ago that that was their preferred option still. Um, and it is now up to the Heathrow to respond and, and put in their appeal, which they say they're going to do. Um, so yeah, the first questions around that are always, well, what's going to happen on this project? You know, I, I already had a call planned this morning with Heathrow to talk about some next steps about some of our GIS and information management plans. And we had that call, and I was like, so... <laughs> <laughs> what does this all mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, for, for now, we, we carry on and, until the senior management team have their strategy worked out. But um, the, you know, and what does that mean for our teams that are working on it and, and what will happen? But the next thing is actually, yeah, this is going to impact not just the Heathrow project, this is going to impact every infrastructure project in the country now. Every infrastructure project is going to have to demonstrate how they meet and uphold um, the government policy and the Paris Agreement. And yeah, that actually brings another opportunity for the likes of us who are information management and, and a analytical and, and visualization. It now means yeah, we have to help demonstrate that through data-driven information and, and decision support systems, hopefully through the ESRI platform, and <laughs> analytical. So yeah, it's um, increasing challenges. 
Yeah, I think, let me make a couple comments on your questions. Uh, the first is, technology's co-evolving with methods. This is an old science concept. Mm -hmm. Every new advance in technology, there's an advance in method, which drives an advance in technology. And so, your three years ago versus now is really observing that methods are co-evolving with the technology, and we're getting better at it. And this is just beginning, actually. I mean, uh, I didn't really share uh, at the beginning the big things that are happening technologically. Big data, although that was shared uh, when we looked at the water issue, being able to deal with billions of points and being able to interpret at the continental or at the global scale. So ability to manage and analyze simply in minutes big data is going to drive new methods and new ways of think thinking. This last presentation was all shared with story maps. Story maps are the new PowerPoint. Because presumably your presentation, you could email to everybody in the room and they would have a textbook and a living example so that they could teach with that textbook, uh, that beautiful piece of work that was done. Uh, story maps are going to explode. Today we make 3 million, uh, 3,000 a day and look at millions and millions of views looking at them. In a year from now, there'll be 10 or 20,000 of these that are made every day and they'll become a new kind of language. Uh, then there's in visualization. Uh, I was really pleased by this last presentation of plugging in with an API into the Adobe materials because graphic designers are now able to do things uh, that they were not able to do before. They can be empowered by geographic information. This time next year, um, there'll be direct integration between ArcGIS datasets and the two popular gaming engines. So what currently exists of taking geographic data and put it into a gaming engine and flying around like Superman will be just a direct connect, just like it is with Adobe today. That's gonna change things because people can, can visualize in the gaming high performance environment and build geographic games, kind of like SimCity, but with real geographic information or do geo design in a gaming engine environment, which is uh, something that today is a huge separation between VizSim and, and geographic data. And AI and machine learning, something I touched on with the new Jupyter Notebooks, are going to make us smarter. Models today that we, we do in kind of a half-assed way will, be, will be, become more sophisticated. We will learn, the models will learn and take on a life of their own based on real evidence and change. Uh, the ability to scale up in the cloud to reach everybody in the world is, is looming here. <laughs> By the end of this year, we'll have raster analytics in the cloud. So you can put your imagery there, you can do analytics that today we do on laptops or in big servers, just as a matter of course. That'll change the way we do modeling. Anyway, I'm rambling on and there's probably 10 more that are in the pipeline. For every advance in technology, there will be the ability to advance in method. That's the evolution relationship that we are all in. We're being driven as a society today, like it or not, by these huge technical advances. And GIS is one of them, but it's by no means the only one. And so we're living in that environment. And that, some say, is driving us crazy. It's driving population. It's allowing us to live better lives, all of those things. But it also is setting it up where our footprint is different. Uh, the last thing I want to say about this change is that um, uh, your company is here, Helen, mm -hmm. and dozens of other large AEC companies are here, but it's the largest, fastest growing segment of GIS that I've ever seen in my entire life, like 40% increase in our own sales. That's one way to measure it. So large A&E firms are figuring out, wow, GIS is something, and geodesign is something. So what I think you're observing is that we're moving geodesign from an academic, project-based learning system to into the, into the realm of, of practitioners who, who actually know project management. 
something that GIS people don't know so much and academics don't know so much. Uh, getting things done schedulely, on time and budget, trying to save money and save time in these massive projects. Uh, we're seeing at this conference, we saw uh, very large companies that are designing new cities. Neom in Saudi Arabia, uh, the, the redevelopment of Mecca in Saudi Arabia are examples. Uh, in Singapore, in, in the Beijing airport, and they're all these massive projects that are not being done in sort of academic frames. People are figuring out how to engineer these tools in sequences that are new sort of methodologies. And with the dramatic growth and what technologically will empower them, I just see this as, is, I mean, this, I'm just seeing the private sector grab onto this and take advantage of these comments concepts and make them become real. And they will address uh, these massive problems of, of inequity or environmental uh, issues that are there. I mean, I'm just rambling on here, but that's my thought of it. Uh, this is really good news for this collection of people that, that companies are, uh, are driving this and will take it. That's with no disrespect to ac the academy or to, to, um, to government agencies. I mean, what's your thought on this? Do you agree with us, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the drive is, is is huge. I mean, I see it in in our own company as how fast. But yeah, whilst we're doing that, we see you know, all the other uh, similar companies who we work with. Again, yeah. that's the thing of of being so many partnering and joint venture opportunities these days uh, that we get involved with. Um, so you know, uh, on, on one hand, we're um, competing for something and then on another hand we're working really closely together yeah. and you know and being and new engagements with government because government's mm. maintaining the data suddenly you're working on their information systems directly mm -hmm. uh, so i think i think that's all good news mm -hmm. there's a question yes carl I, I was very interested in your comment about mm -hmm. the heathrow decision mm -hmm. and that the next stage may be to test it vis-a-vis -vis the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. L let me talk from a global perspective for a moment. I hope that the people here had the chance to look closely at the exhibit that was put up by the International Geodesign Collaboration of projects uh, that have a very big difference to the projects that were shown by most of you here in the summit. I've been to all of the summits. The characteristic of the projects that you've shown are, first of all, a high degree of professionalism, all of the things that you should be praised for, except one thing. Everybody had their own classification of land and their own color code for different activities, processes, and outcomes. Almost nobody showed a legend. So if you're really, if you're really interested in testing whether that project fits the Paris Agreement and that there's a human being called the Minister of the Paris Agreement. And each of you is presenting your project to the Minister of the Paris Agreement. That job is impossible because you're not using the same language. The difference between your presentations here and the ones in the cafeteria is that the collaboration is using the same language. We're using the same land use classification system we're using the same color codes, we're using the same scales, and we're using the same reporting formats. And at this point, we've got 141 universities around the world sharing those, and nobody's being told what the problem is, and nobody's being told how to solve the problem. But when they present it, and they're presenting it against a very primitive assessment of the um, IGCs, uh, the, in, I'm oh, sorry, the, the SDG, the Sustainability Goals, which most of the countries of the world have adopted, that model of representation, I expect to begin to see here next year on real projects, because you're probably going to have to adopt the SDGs as the measure of presenting your project to the government, and for the first time. And it'll be very interesting to see how you do it. 
It'll be very interesting to see how Jacobs does it. It'll be very interesting to see how the state of Texas Water Board does it. But if I was the Minister of Interior of the United States, I'd insist on that. Now, you need to know that Jack and I and Peter Rogers, 35 or so years ago, went to the National Science Foundation of the United States and said, fund a small amount of money, probably $50,000, to propose a set of graphic representation standards for every project in the United States. Now, I'm willing to bet that that's going to happen globally soon. And I think that the companies that are represented here and the governments that are here eventually will have to change their color codes and their representation scales and techniques. And it's either think about it sooner or later as corporate practice and state and local government practice. Because that's actually the only way that neighboring projects can talk to each other, people can collaborate across each other's specialties, and the different scales of projects can feed upward or downward through the representational levels of government. It's who the only be, way. Carl, R good. Who would be interested to work with Carl on writing a book about this? It's really I chop. I don't know if I want anybody to collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let Carl, me, why don't you write, let Carl, me just why don't, Carl, why don't you write a book? And right. define those standards. Brian and, I, Brian and I are thinking about it. But let, right. let, me, let me say this very, very seriously. Very, very seriously. The more that geodesign or any kind of mapping and analysis spreads itself globally, the more Texas has to talk to Oklahoma. Because watersheds cross boundaries. And if Oklahoma has one color code and Texas has another cold, color code, and you can see the boundary, on your representation, you know you've got a failed communication. It's okay, as simple you, as that. You guys have to write that book. Next year, <laughs> we're going to see it. <laughs> Don't you guys agree? Great, great. This is call it, why don't you just call it Steinitz Standards? This is good. I like this idea. <laughs> Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm getting the hook here. Uh, this has been a great, a great few days. I so welcome you here and appreciate you coming. And we'll do this again and again for as long as I live. Mm -hmm. Are you going to come back, Helen? Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> let's hear it for Helen and all the speakers. So here is that envelope with the coveted lightning talk uh, winner. So we truly saved the best for last this year. Janet Sibernagel, the University of Wisconsin. Yeah. Come on down. Join us in saying goodbye to everyone. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you all for making this a great year. I'll see you back next year. Thank you.